Hey, hey, hey. So welcome to the July series of the So What Does That Look Like Bible Study, where our focus for this month will be, so what does it look like to get paid to do what I was made to do? Like, I'm still pretty amused, uh, pretty just kind of intrigued by the idea. We've seen the video kind of floating around there where this father and son are doing this gibberish kind of conversation um, just really at their own homes where the father is literally just being a father, just being attentive, just interacting with his son and whoa, like blow up, right? The videos everywhere. They land a contract with a company to start doing another video. And all of a sudden he is being paid to do what he was made to do, right? Like this father was having a gibberish conversation with his son for free, but here we are like, yeah. And over and over and over again, I, I know one, um, um, comedian, I believe his name is Kaylin. He was simply just critiquing food, kind of like for the fun of it and cracking jokes. And now he has his own show. He was sponsored by another major TV personality. And we've all seen like the different uh, YouTubes or other videos that have just gone viral on social media platforms. And these people go from being just regular folk doing what they love to do from whether it's singing in a subway or singing in a museum or singing in a store or whatever. And then all of a sudden they are literally being paid to do what they were made to do. I think about the 90 minute millionaire, the lady who was simply making makeup kind of cause she wanted to play around with colors. And then all of a sudden she just blows up right and um over and over and over again i'm sure you could add examples of seeing that happen and i think you know what though is that possible for each of us are there really skill sets and talents and gifts that each of us have whereby we can be paid to do what we were made to do like that thing that we would absolutely do for free i believe so and i believe that god's word gives us principles on that so we're going to actually use the month of july with it being the second half of this year to really try to lean into that more and get some biblical pr principles some biblical tips on how can we actually position ourselves to be paid to do what we were made to do with that being said i'm going to go ahead and jump right in the word and let you know as an upfront type of thing from Exodus 2 verse number 9. Um, Jochebed's uh, mother, Jochebed, not Jochebed's mother, Jochebed, who is the mother of Moses, receives this mandate from the princess, from Pharaoh's daughter. She says, go and nurse this child for me and I will pay you your, your wages. So that's my quick disclaimer. That's the end of the story. Jochebed, the mother of Moses, a mother who would have nursed her son for free, protected her son for free, raised her son for free, actually is ended up being paid by the, by the princess, by Pharaoh's daughter. So we're just going to go into that particular book in Exodus uh, chapter one through chapter two, verse number nine, and kind of just glean some principles. And here's the deal. I was really trying to sort through how to teach this because there's so many rich nuggets that's found in the, in that Exodus chapter one through Exodus two, verse number nine. And so this is what I'm really going to do. I'm just going to try to set up the backdrop of the story to give us some clarity on what is happening. And then I'm going to also share several takeaways, several nuggets. And as you journey throughout this week, I'll post another Bible study next week of a different faith sibling. So as you journey throughout this week, just kind of moving towards next week's Bible study, you can all week long think about the different reflection questions and really apply them to your life. In addition to that, as an additive for the Bible study. I've also created a reflective sheet, a PDF that's available at the website on www.drgenalynn.com. So if you want the PDF, if you want the reflective sheet to kind of follow along and think through all week long on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, just different thoughts about this Bible study, you're able to get that again at www.drgenalynn.com. In the meantime, because you're probably here and you're watching from YouTube, I invite you to subscribe and share, continue to allow other people people to benefit from these simple teachings with tangible tips that we can apply to our lives today. So again, what does it look like to get paid to do what I was made to do? And we are looking at Jochebed in Exodus chapter one. So here is the backdrop because I asked myself, reminding myself, so how 
How in the world did the children of, of, of the Israelites, the Israelite children, how did they end up in Egypt to begin with? Because here is the backdrop. Pharaoh has gotten big, big mad at the children of, of Israel, right? At the Israelites' children. And he has issued the mandate that every male child who is born needs to be chucked into the river like he wants to kill them. The Bible specifically says that when he observed them, in Exodus 1, chapter 9, he said they multiply and they increase and they grow and they're productive and they're prosperous at everything. And if we're not careful, they will overtake us. So catch that as a really quick nugget. The enemy could see the potential in them, right? Perhaps potential that they didn't even see in themselves because the beginning of the context is sim- the beginning of the chapter, the context is simply this. So if we think back and we will actually talk about him, Joseph was a dreamer and Joseph was taking taken into captivity in Egypt once he was sold by his brothers. So he's in Egypt. When a famine comes through the land in Canaan, the family of about 70 people migrate to Egypt and it's under Joseph's care that that family is protected. Well, while they are in Egypt, they are under good care because everybody who knows Joseph, they like Joseph pretty much, right? So his family is protected. And look at here, you guys, a group of about 70 people, the Bible says, grows into a nation. In captivity, they grow into a nation. They multiply. They are productive. They they um, bring forth fruit, okay? And so, so a new king takes charge, a new pharaoh takes charge, and he doesn't remember Joseph, and he doesn't remember the gods of, jo- of the God of Joseph. And so when he looks at these people, he sees their potential. He sees the greatness that's on the inside of them. He sees their ability to flourish, even in captivity, and he determines that he has to do something about that. So he issues again the mandate that says every male child needs to be killed. Every male child needs to be drowned, y'all, in a river. As soon as they're born, he says, to the um to the to the to the mothers who helped to bring forth birth to the midwives he says to the mid he says to the midwives like as soon as they come out of the womb like i want you there to catch them and throw them into the river who does that <laughs> Like who does that? But that's the, that's the edict that has gone forth. So that's the context in which this story starts. So even as I begin to think about how do we position ourselves, what does it really look like to, um, to be paid to do what we are made to do just at the beginning of the story, before we even get to Jacobet, this point kind of resonates for me that we have to begin to see ourselves through a valuable lens. If you remember, in, as I mentioned, in verse number, chapter one, verse number nine, the Pharaoh says it. He sees that, they, that the children of Israel are a prosperous, flourishing people. But what I'm also sure of is that the children of Israel are in captivity and there are no signs, there are no struggles at this time about them pushing forward to maximize their potential to be free and to occupy the promised land. They have already become comfortable in captivity. They're kind of just doing their status quo, just doing their status quo life. It is the Pharaoh, the enemy who sees their real full potential. He sees the capability in them. So as I begin to think about this lesson about what does it look like to get paid to do what we're made to do, perhaps that's the first lean in point. And it can be a point of reflection throughout your week. Is there an area in my life that I really do not see my value in? I don't see my skill set or my talent as a huge asset. Somebody else may, and the way that you would know that is to really listen to the thing that they keep trying to destroy or tear down. Somebody else can possibly identify and try to minimize the gifts or the talents that are on the inside of you. When the enemy sees that about them, he says, let's destroy them. So as we're leaning into how do I get paid to do what I'm made to do, maybe there's this aspect of yourself that has become comfortable of ourselves, that has become comfortable with the status quo. And we in and of ourselves are not pushing ourselves to maximize our talents and our gift sets. But if we really want to know sometimes what is that thing that is about us that stands out, find out what you're not so cooperative 
uh, maybe family members or colleagues or coworkers are saying about you? What is that thing perhaps that is forever seeming to be squelched or pointed out about you? That could be the very thing that you do so well. That could be the very thing that will lead you into your promise and lead you into your victory, lead you into your business, okay? So that's just kind of a sidebar idea as we listen to the text with the lens of how do I get paid to do what I am made to do? So the Israelite children, again, they're just doing life. They're comfortable in captivity. They're not uh, strategizing about plans to become free or get to the promised land. But in the midst of all of this captivity and struggle, the enemy, Pharaoh, sees that they're still flourishing. He sees that they're still multiplying, that they're still going forth. And he launches an all-out strategic intention to destroy them, right? So he begins to plot and he tells the midwives, as soon as the Hebrew boys are born, catch their babies and throw them into the river. He wants to make life very difficult. Can you imagine the grief? Can you imagine the, the mourning that must have been going on throughout the land as, as babies were ripped from their, newborn babies were ripped from their mother's arms and immediately drowned? Can you imagine the sadness and depression, the, the impact that his decisions were having on their emotions? And and they were already in captivity as another layer to that. So he plots and he begins to do that. Um, now the midwives, they had a certain reverence for God and they really didn't want to do it. So they weren't trying to toss the babies into the river. And it just so happens then that right around um, Exodus chapter two, we are introduced to Jochebed, who is the mother of Moses. And so again, these midwives are charged with almost just tracking these Hebrew women who are pregnant. And if one has a male child to be there and be ready. So you can only imagine the trepidation that was in Jacobet's heart. After all, they don't have like the things that we have access to today where you can go and get the gender of your baby determined or anything like that. So you can imagine that Jacobet perhaps was just anxious and already praying and already trying to think through what would happen if she was to have a male child. So then this is what happens. Jacob Jochebed has a male child. This male baby comes out and Jochebed looks at her baby. And this is the same baby, the gender for which the king has said, Pharaoh has said, toss him into the river. He is, he should die. Jochebed looks at her baby and the Bible says in, in Exodus two, verse number two, that she saw her child that he was a godly child, that he was a beautiful child. So the enemy looks at what she has and true enough, the enemy recognizes the potential of the people, but he just says, he says that of this, it should be destroyed. Jochebed looks at the exact same thing that the Pharaoh has said should be destroyed. And Jochebed says, no, it's worth rescuing, right? So therein would be my official tip number one is that when people look at what you have and they may try to minimize it or take value away from it or, or, or mitigate it or play it small, you have to rise up in authority over your own gifts, over your own talents, over your own skill set, and say, no, this is valuable. I don't care that you're saying that it should be destroyed. I don't care that you're saying that it should not be recognized, that it is not valuable, that it cannot be utilized. I am saying that it's worth something. I look at it and I call it beautiful. I call it good. I call it productive. I call it valuable. I call it worthwhile. You have the final say so on how you will assess or evaluate your gifts, your talents, your skill set, whatever it is that you may one day want to produce into some type of business where you are paid to do what you are made to do. And sometimes you guys, I'm in simple places like, let's just say Crave Cupcakes. And I just think about it, right? They're selling these cupcakes for three, four bucks. And I just think there was somebody who told the person who had this idea, nobody's going to buy cupcakes for $4. Who would buy one cupcake for $4? Or when you think about nut and butt cakes and it's just this little cake and somebody I can guarantee you told the person who had that idea, nobody's going to buy that. But let me just confess to y'all, I have stood in line in both of those places. I loves me, loves me a good craves cupcake and I loves me a good, um, a nothing but cake, right? So 
this idea, this notion that people can look at your ideas and they can try to devalue them, but you alone have the determining factor and whether you will really push through and see value in what you bring to the table. So again, with Jochebed, she looked at her baby and even though the Pharaoh has said, I want to destroy it. And, and mind you, he did recognize the value, but he didn't want that to multiply and be utilized. She looked at it and said, no, it's worth saving. It's worth preserving. So that would be my tip number one. Look at your own gifts. Look at your own talents, your own skill set, and you determine how valuable they are. You determine the worthwhileness of what you bring to the table because I guarantee you there's some value in it. There's somebody who needs exactly what you bring to the world. Here's number two. So she looks at it and she determines, I am going to I am going to protect my child. The Bible says that she hid her child for three months. So I can just tell you that that did not come without sacrifice, right? This is a normal, regular newborn baby. So you all could probably name it with me. The baby needed to be fed. The baby needed to be clothed. The baby cried. The baby needed to be changed. The baby needed to be nursed. And she is trying to do all of that while hiding this growing, crying, hungry, uh, on the verge of beginning to, to try to sit up or whatever that is, to, baby, she's sacrificing. And she probably understands that if this Pharaoh is willing to toss newborn babies into the river and kill them, what then would he be willing to do for me? So here again would be another tip or another something that I would want you to think about. How do I position myself to be paid to do what I am made to do? I have to be willing to make the sacrifices to nurture, to protect, to, to mature the gifts and the talents, the valuable thing that I have. Um, recently, and even as recent as this year, I've been on a personal type of decision where I said to myself, you know what, I'm going to really steer away from buying like new clothes, new shoes, just extra stuff like that. And any money that I would have used on those things, I'm going to use them to grow my business, to invest in my, my retirement plan, to invest in my real estate goals and things like that. That's the sacrifice that I am willing to make. Well, I love me a new pair of shoes. And I will take them as gifts, right? But in as much as my, me, myself and I going out just intentionally shopping and things like that, mm, no, I'm going to make a sacrifice to put any proceeds that I would put over here to put over there. That's just me personally. This is not a lesson about not shopping and that type of thing. And I'm just saying to you that Moses' mother, Jochebed, she made some decisions counting up the cost and the risk of what it would look like to nurture her child, her man child, what the king said to destroy, she wanted to save and protect and she was willing to count up the cost and make the necessary um, adjustments to her lifestyle to do that. If that meant she had to go perhaps in a back room to nurse him, if that meant she couldn't go certain places because um, she had a baby at home and she needed to be with him protecting him and she couldn't just be out and about with her, her girlfriends even in that day, you have to, we have to make the necessary decisions to nurture and protect. We have to make the necessary sacrifices to nurture and protect. We have to make the necessary investments to nurture and protect the gifts and talents that we have. As a quick sidebar, I will, I will add this. One of the primary reasons that I determined to even in transition from working full time and other places was that I realized that oftentimes my dreams, my goals, my visions were getting my leftover energy. We're getting my leftover mental capacity, getting my leftover physical strength because I'd already worked a full day elsewhere. And that is no whatever about those, those organizations. It is simply this that I determined though, that if I was ever going to have some areas of my life be made manifest, I was going to have to give my best energy and my best self to those things as a priority. Making that adjustment did not come without some sacrifices. There were certain standards and certain uh, experiences that I had to forego because of course my income adjusted as I was la launching out there on my own, but I'm willing to make those sacrifices to see what I'm up to get a fair shot at making it in this world. So I'm saying that to you as well. Now that again is not an instruction or even a, a 
prompting to walk away from your job, all of those decisions and things you have to make before yourself and between you and the Lord or however you process making key decisions. But what I am saying is if we're going to posture ourselves to be paid to do what we are made to do, we have to be willing to make the sacrifices to protect and to nurture it. And that's what we see that Jochebed does. So as we journey on through this, and I love this part, I've talked about it a little bit in the promo last week. So this is what Jochebed does in verse number four and verse number three, uh, chapter two, verse number three of Exodus. Jochebed says, I am going to make a basket full of reeds. When her son had grown to the point that he was, uh, he was too big to be hidden anymore. She said, I'm going to make a basket out of reeds and I'm going to put him into the river. What I find so interesting and fascinating about that is that we know to bring about destruction. The Pharaoh had already said, we're going to chunk the baby into the river. The mother, though, Jochebed says to provide safety for him, I'm going to put him into the river. So here is clearly, clearly, clearly my tip number two. We have to be able to take situations that someone else would try to utilize to discourage or destroy us, see it through a different lens, take authority of it, and use it to actually build or promote the thing that we desire to do. For example, if someone um, says that you talk like way too much, I had a, I have a dear mentee of mine that I love dearly who was sharing at one of our courses. So it's not private because she shared this as one, as one of our courses and then gave a testimonial about it. She said that early on in life, one of the things that was her negative thought is that people would never want to um, hear her truth. And she got that from an experience as a child in which she went to a teacher to tell the truth and the teacher corrected her, reprimanded her and told her, stop telling. She allowed that to be like the story in her head that no one would actually want to hear her truth. And it wasn't until she took authority over that, took authority over that negative thought, took authority over that lie and switched it around that she now finds herself literally where her platform, her thriving platform is all about telling the truth. People pay her to speak, pay her to teach God's word, the ultimate truth and those types of things. So she took what was said about her in a negative way, a negative situation and has now flipped it, took her power back, flipped it and is using it to actually project her towards this full fledged being paid to do what she was made to do type of adventure. So I invite each of us actually challenge each of us. Oftentimes our greatest gift, our greatest skill set is found in the area where people can work diligently to try to discourage you or to come against you. That's when you need to even more lean into that thing and flip the situation, take power over it and allow yourself to go forward in that thing that the enemy may recognize about you. That may be the very reason why he's trying to tear you down. I'm tempted to even give you a reflection question right there. I think I'll go ahead and give it, even though it's on the handout. The reflection question is simply this. Is there an area of your life? where you have found yourself because of circumstances feeling very discouraged or feeling minimized or feeling like there's no value in what you bring to the table? Is there an area in your life where such is the case, but just in kind of hearing this and beginning to think, is there an actual way that you can take that circumstance, that situation and cause it to benefit you? We stand on this word. God has already said that all things work together for the good, for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So I encourage you, don't allow a negative lens from someone else's perspective to shape your perspective on your gifts and talents. Flip that thing and make it work for you. Amen. Okay. So we're going to journey on through. So here's the deal. Um, she puts her baby in the river, right? The place that he, that the Pharaoh wanted to be a place of destruction. She causes it to be a place of safety. And in that she becomes strategic. She enlists her own daughter to kind of stand nearby the river and watch over the basket kind of indiscreetly. A whole other sidebar that, that I talk about in the reflection uh, sheet. Who have you solicited? Who have you connected to? Who have you invited to be a part of your dream and your vision so that that thing can have some traction beyond your 
hands and your feet. So the daughter is there and the daughter is watching and the daughter um, notices when the princess comes to take a bath and the princess finds the baby and the baby is crying and the princess heart is immediately tugged. And so the daughter usurps herself into that situation, puts herself into that situation. And she suggests, do you want me to go and get a Hebrew woman to perhaps come and take care of this baby for you? So do you get that? The daughter is there and she is postured to be a help. So as that sidebar I mentioned earlier, that's, that's a, that's a kind of a, a line of reflection that we should go down. Who have we actually keyed into our vision and our dream? Who are we connecting with that can give added traction, added fuel, added eyes, added hands, added feet to the dream that we are working on so that we can get paid to do what we are made to do? Who can suggest our names? Who can recommend us? I, I have shared how even in my speaking engagements with the number of engagements that I had, it is people who have opened those doors for me. It is the connection. So we have to be better at that. We have to fully maximize that. But at any rate, the daughter says that like, do you want me to go and get one of these Hebrew women who can nurse the baby for you? And the prince is thinking, yeah, yeah, good idea. And as true as it can happen, um, the, the daughter goes in like verse number seven and eight of Exodus chapter two. She goes and gets her mom, Moses's mother. Her brother is who she goes and get their mom, brings her back to the princess, right? And the princess basically says to her in verse number nine, go and nurse this child for me. <laughs> And I will pay you your wages. Like that moves me. Here is this mom who have probably worried the entire time that she has the baby in her womb, wondering if it's going to be a little girl or a little boy, already knowing the mourning and the crying that she hears in the land, already knowing that the king is set out to destroy possibly what's carried on the inside of her. And when she gives birth, probably bittersweetly, it is a little boy. And she already knows that, that, that death is right outside of the door. Like the king has positioned midwives to come and to literally catch the baby when they come come out of the womb to throw them in the river. Can you imagine if you are a parent or just love a child, the trepidation that perhaps was in her heart, but then she, she is willing to make the necessary sacrifices and adjustments to look at her own baby, her own gift to the thing that she has carried and to say, this is valuable and I will not allow it to be destroyed. We have to have that same ownership about the things that are being carried on the inside of us. Something within us has to resist the voices of the enemy, of negative people, of other sounds, and sometimes the voices that are in our own heads. And we have to say, this is valuable and I will adjust. I will sacrifice to protect it. I will not allow it to be destroyed. So she does that. She protects it. She takes the scenario where the Pharaoh wants the river to be the death of her child. And she uses that same atmosphere, that same environment to nurture and protect her child. And he here is the deal in verse number nine, when the nurse, when the, when the princess seeks a nurse and she is escorted to the princess, you all, she walks through that open door. I can't say that she was that was without fear. I can't say that there wasn't some knee trembling and some voice shaking. I can't say that there wasn't some processing of what if I get caught? What if she realizes that I'm the mama? I don't know that, that all of that was silence, but what I do know is that Jacobet accepted and walked through that open door. And as she walked through that open door, number one, she used discretion. At no point does she say in the Bible, at least what we can see in the text, does she say, well, you know, I'm really his mama. And you know, I'm the one that built. She doesn't try to get extra credit and do some over talking. She uses discretion, right? And then she walks through that open door and she uses that opportunity to raise, to nurse her own child, to teach Moses about her, his own people and to teach Moses about his own God. And how do we know that? because we know the end of the story. He rises up and he becomes the one that goes forward to help set his people free. So she gets paid, y'all. Think about that. She gets paid to nurse Moses, her own son. She gets paid to teach Moses about his own people. She gets paid to teach Moses about his own God. She is paid to do what she is made to do. She is paid to do what she would literally do for free. So that's our quick lesson. How are we able to be paid to do what we are made to do? I've given you a whole lot of like sidebar, um, 
observations and reflection questions. So I'll streamline it down to these three tips is what I would say. Tip number one, I would say is like Jacobed, you have to see the value in your own stuff. Regardless of what is being said around and about you, you have to see the value in your own stuff. Number two, you have to be willing. Let me say we. We have to be willing to make the necessary sacrifices to protect and nurture and invest in our own stuff. Oftentimes we are good for wanting other people to support our businesses and and ring our bells and say our names, but do you invest in you? Are you willing to buy your own first ticket or your own first product? Put your own money into your dream, right? She was willing to make the necessary sacrifices to nurture her own gift. And lastly, but but not definitely not number least, when the opportunity presented itself, she was willing, willing and ready and able to walk through those open doors. And I talked a little bit about how she used discretion, how she went, and we don't know what her fear or whatever was like, but she went through those open doors. So I encourage us. And can you imagine the princess, like the palace, how big of an open door that may have appeared to be to her, but she walked through it anyway. So we love to say, do it afraid, do it afraid, do it anyway. So those would be my three tips. But again, I want you to know that I have some other sidebar, very, very connected, but sidebar is kind of reflection questions that are prepared for you. I have that again on my website at www.drgenalyn.com. It is basically a, a, a tool that will give us more things to think about as we journey through this week. And why is that? You guys, because I honor the greatness that's in you. I really believe that there is a, a talent or a gift in each of us. There's this natural skill set or this natural area of interest that we all like to do. And that may be different for, that will be different for each of us, but it is no less for each of us. I have a sister who loves to watch kids. She's good with little kids. And now she has her business in that, right? I just think that each of us can find our way if we take the time to really look at the um, PDF that I'm attaching for you at my website, but then also to just really believe believe in yourself. So I honor the greatness in you. I invite you again to pick up the PDF at the website. I invite you again to subscribe to the YouTube channel and to share, and then to join me again, be on the lookout for next week's lesson as we continue to um, study our faith siblings who were paid to do what they were made to do. God bless you. Have a wonderful, fantastic rest of the week. Bye now.